I'm the founding director of the research unit at Oxford University that is hosting today's seminar on sustainable mega projects. I'm thrilled to welcome our distinguished speakers and over 450 participants from around the world who've decided to join this uh, today, uh, spanning all manner of time zones, all the way from Australia to California. So a very warm welcome. The series is hosted by the Smith School of uh, Enterprise and the Environment at Oxford University in conjunction with Foresight Works Limited. Um, in my role uh, as an academic director of the research unit in sustainable mega projects, um, I also work on infrastructure mega, uh, technology um, and run Foresight Works uh, along with uh, my colleagues. And we're building artificial intelligence software to power mega projects and help them deliver faster, cheaper, and better. The topic today that we'll be discussing is are rail mega projects a nightmare to deliver? Lessons for successful delivery. Um, and Crossrail Limited are one of our flagship customers, um, and that software is being delivered uh, with leadership from Bechtel team. So I'm doubly delighted to welcome Mark Weil, CEO of Crossrail Limited, um, and Anthea dorman uh, who is a project director at Bechtel for HS2. I'm going to have a phenomenal discussion with them today. The format is as follows. I'm going to first turn to Mark. He'll have 15 minutes to give us a test-style talk um, on his big ideas for lessons uh, for successful delivery. Um, we'll then turn to Anthea, um, and then we'll open the conversation to all the participants and answer your questions. So without further ado, Mark, a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Atif, and um, hello, Anthea. You and I work together on Crossrail together. Great to see you again. Hey, uh, 15 minutes on Crossrail. We could probably write a book. Uh, maybe when I finish this, I will write a book on it. But just frame what Crossrail is. A lot, a lot of people will know it was... Um, it's 44 kilometers of tunneling beneath London, a uh, metro style operation, but it joins two big railways together from the Great Western, uh, Heathrow, Reading, out in the West, and it joins the Eastern Railway together. So it's kind of a bit like RER in, in Paris would be. So during its time, it was uh, the world's sixth biggest infrastructure program, and certainly the biggest program in Europe. Um, it started in the year 2000, so it's taken 20 years to get to this point. We'll come back to that. And as most people would know, it got into some significant difficulty in, um, in 2018. It was due to open on the 9th of December 2018. And sometime around the middle of that year, the project team thought they had six to nine months to go to opening and maybe needed another £200 million pounds. Actually, then they were three years away from opening and needed another three billion pounds. Now, the obvious question is, how, how did that happen? Um, I was on the board. I was an executive director on the board. And I was running the Tube at the time, managing director of London Underground. And I, I took over the CEO of Crossrail in November 2018 to get the railway open. Um, all in all, it's a 20 billion pound investment, Crossrail. And as I say, it's taken 20 years to get here. And where we are today... We're deep into the process of trial running, and we are at the moment between between five and nine months away from opening. Hopefully it's the five rather than the nine, but we're very close to opening, and we're about to enter something called trial operations, which is the, the last phase before opening. So we're kind of nearly there. But when you unpack it and look at the lessons, I've written down five lessons that might be of interest to people around the world. I know lots of people are working on these projects. Uh, Crossrail is a huge project, you know, 20 billion pounds, 75,000 people have worked on Crossrail. Um, and it's a digital railway, entirely digital. It has three different signaling systems, CBTC in the middle, ETCS in the, um, the, new, the new emerging national rail rules, and of course the legacy signaling system. So an immensely complex digital asset um, that got into real trouble in 2018. And I've written five lessons down for, I guess I'm the ghost of Christmas past, aren't I? So if anybody's out there on a mega project, how are you doing against these five things? Uh, firstly, end dates, fixed end dates are deadly. Uh, Crossrail fixed its end date of the 9th of December, 2018 in 2008, 10 years hence, a fixed end date. And of course that, that really distorted behaviors in the project team. By the time we got into 2015, 2016, two to three to four years from the end, the project was under immense pressure, which we'll talk about later. And the, the idea of a fixed end date, I think in retrospect, 
has been seen to be uh, not, not really a very mature view of a mega digital program. Uh, something like Crossrail is more akin to a big IT program rather than an infrastructure program in a lot of ways. And of course, in IT agile programs, people talk about windows of uncertainty. And when I took this job over, one of the very first things we did was we, we kind of abandoned the concepts of fixed terminal end dates and spoke more about windows of opportunity. So we, we, we converted our whole program to um, an early and late dates, windows. Um, the internal project team to drive to the early dates, but publicly explain to people why the range of uncertainty, the risks that could occur to create an opening window. And to this day, we say our opening window at the moment is between February next year and June next year. And we've narrowed that window down over the past three years. Now, of course, we try to get to the early date. We're trying to get this, this railway open in February, but it could go to June if we have certain factors that affect us in reliability growth software development. So end dates are deadly. And I think for every mega program leader, the, the ability to manage a, the early date internally and the external date publicly, the longer date publicly, is one of the art of major program management. Now, I know it's difficult with politicians and people's expectations, but it's absolutely crucial that in the world of mega digital programs, we talk about windows of uncertainty and explain to people why that window exists, but drive the internal team to the early date. The other big lesson on Crossrail was, certainly my time doing this, the early date can't be a P0. It can't be a purely deterministic date. Otherwise, every single day you're losing. So our, our early date is more like a P15, P20, to give people a chance to win. The idea of a P0 early date is, I, I think, a bit flawed in such a, a difficult, challenging program. So number one, end dates are deadly. Talk about windows of uncertainty. Number two, Crossrail system engineering um, architecture has been replicated around the world. It's, it's, it's world class. You know, we've got a classic B model. There are 16 million, 16 million assurable elements of Crossrail, some virtual, some physical. They all end up in 250,000 assurance documents, 250,000, quarter of a million assurance documents here that sweep up 16 million assurance artifacts. So the system engineering is absolutely sensational. The thing that was missing in Crossrail was system integration. And to me, system integration is almost a contact spot in a positive way. It is the ability for people to work really together to create something and remove friction and interdependency. Crossrail created 37 individual uh, procurement contracts in 2010. For certain reasons for the market at that time, it was broken into smaller packages than maybe some of you have out there. That was okay, but it created many, many multiple interfaces where people at the tactical front line were dependent on everybody else. And I guess my big, my big learning of Crossrail in this area is that system integration has to be centralized and controlled. So for example, we bought the train two years after we purchased the signaling system. And we never really integrated the train and the signaling system together until we created, in, in my time, plateaus, plateau teams, you know, configuration control. So the idea of system engineering being essential, but system integration being absolutely um, fundamental in what we would achieve. So the difference between system engineering, system integration is important. And intrinsic in that, Crossrail was trying to deliver the end state on day one the full cathedral with the stained glass windows and all functionality, all bells and whistles. And one of the first things I did in 2019 was to create a minimum viable product that could be scaled up. You know, you don't start with iPhone 10, do you? You start with iPhone 1 and it gets scaled up. Uh, so why would an infrastructure program of such digital complexity be any different? So we, we created a minimum viable product and that's all, a, all the genre of system integration. And people will say on this call, I'm sure they think, well, we've got a system integration department, but is it central to your thinking? Is it around the top table? Is it with the COO, the CFO, the CEO, CEO the program director? Is system integration and the art of it central to the mission? And I think that that's a key, key lesson that we've tried to 
um, deal with over the past three years that I've been doing this job. I mean, related to that, my third point is design modularity. Unfortunately, not only was Crossrail disaggregated into 37 uh, individual contracts, they were all highly bespoke. Um, hardly any modularity, plug and play. Almost all of Crossrail has been built in situ, tested in situ, commissioned and integrated in situ. Instead of building things in factories, testing them in factories, bringing them to site and plugging them together like modules. So the design modularity of Crossrail was really lacking. And that occurred because the procurement, the procurement flawed a lot of requirements expertly into the supply chain, but gave too much latitude for tier one and tier two contractors to have different pumps, different CCTV, different protocols, different interface protocols. So design modularity. If I was at the beginning of a mega program now, and Anthony's doing with HS2 phase 2B, I think, I would be all over modularity. Could we build this in a factory somewhere and bring it to site and plug it in? And that would have saved a lot of grief on Crossrail, particularly at the end, when, as you all know, getting to this infrastructure, you know, nine central stations in Crossrail, all of them are 10 stories deep in one of the world's most complex cities. Trying to test and commission something in that environment is very, very hard. So I think for everybody at the beginning of programs, design modularity is the key. My classic example on Crossrail are doors. We all know how complex doors are on, on underground stations. We created an environment where the architects could create bespoke halls that would then go and buy doors. We've got thousands of different shaped doors on Crossrail. Instead of saying, we'll have 10 doors, 10 doors, and the architects can make the station look beautiful around our 10 standard modular doors, all of them with the right fire damping, the right contacts, the right fire hardness, the safety certificate, 10 doors manufactured by two or three manufacturers. There are 10,000 doors on Crossrail, and a lot of them are different. So design modularity, number three lesson for me. Uh, number four, um, 20 years to build Crossrail, 10 years of planning, 10 years of execution. Lots of people have worked on Crossrail for more than 18 years. They've had their whole career here. And in that big, vast time, a uh, couple of lessons really that Crossrail didn't do well. It was perceived in 2008 that the biggest single risk would be um, driving the tunneling uh, 30 meters below London, probably the world's most complex city to, to drive in because of the ar archeology span and the skyscrapers and the complexity of London. It was perceived the tunneling drive would be the biggest risk. And that was expertly done with only about four months slippage in 2013. The team thought that the major risk was over and the m and &E fit out and integration would be a lesser risk. Now, clearly that has been proven to be wrong. So my big lesson in number four, the shifting of time. Make sure that you are risk, looking at the right risk at that moment. And the reality is the integration risk has been far greater than the TBM drive, far greater. Maybe it's by a factor of 10. And that was completely misunderstood. And the conventional project tools did not pick up or inform in 2015-16 the aggregation of system integration risk. Um, things weren't done done. Dependencies between interfaces weren't pro properly resolved, which meant trying to pull together 250,000 assurance documents was an impossible task. Foresight, actually, we're using Foresight now at the very end of our program. If we had Foresight at the beginning, and in 2015-16, this aggregating risk of system integration was revealed to the leadership team, I think we could have saved a year and maybe it's over a billion pounds. This program would probably still have overrun, but the lack of insight in 2015, 16, 17 of the real risk, the aggregating system integration risk was a real problem. And part of it was the mindset of the team, civil engineering team who thought they'd achieved the biggest risk of the tunneling drive. The same civil engineering team went on to the integration. So another key lesson of Crossrail is right team at the right time. Now this is very hard and challenging, and I don't know much about American football, but I do know and I've heard that they have certain teams come on for certain players. And really, you want your civil engineering people doing the tunneling drive and major civils. 
You want your M&E people doing the fit out, and you want your system integration people at the end. And unfortunately, that means over 20 years, you probably need three or four squads. And on Crossrail, we persisted with the same skill set, and, and, and we ended up with a, unfortunately, the management team didn't spot the aggregation of risk. Final thing for me. Um, so we've talked about four big lessons. Don't set a fixed end date. Value system integration as a contact spot. Make sure your design is modular and testable offsite, and make sure that the risk profile is monitored throughout the whole life set and you have the right people at the right time. Key lessons. But the fifth one is actually the most important to me, which is the human element. And because Crossrail had become so big and complex, they had a very good collaborative spirit actually in Crossrail. But unfortunately, they didn't have transparency to what the risk was. So the fifth element to me is the most important, and it's transitioning from collaboration to something higher. And the higher order thing I call owning the whole. We've actually on Crossrail transcended to a world now where literally the tier ones, the tier twos, the tier threes, the system integrator, the team, the, the train builder, the internal team, the delivery partner, Bechtel, Nichols, Jacobs, We've decided to own the whole, i.e. everybody's success or failure is the interest of somebody else, rather than like a collaborative spirit. We've tried to own the whole together. And the only way you can own the whole is by being completely transparent and having line of sight, removing false screens, spotting the gaps, encouraging people to say what is missing. Because we found once the gaps and the missing elements have become transparent and visible to a cadre of people who are owning the whole, they can achieve great things. And the success over the past two or three years of Crossrail has been a group of brilliant people who are largely the same people, a few changes at the top, but they're largely the same people. The difference is they have transparency to the mission. So lots of lessons in Crossrail. Uh, we're nearly there now. We're very sorry that we've three years late and we've blown a three billion pound hole in our budget but in the long run of things of course you know we built it for 200 years and we are nearly there but i very much hope that these lessons can be learned uh, and with that i'll hand back to you the team thank you thank you very much mark tremendous lessons uh, from a iconic project and it's worth the wait uh we look forward to uh to becoming cross crossroad passengers um so just to recap the five lessons that mark mentioned uh first is fix and dates are deadly uh use windows of uh opening second sy system integration has to be centralized um and an element of mvp and even in these big projects which was uh, uh rang home third is design modularity Fourth, looking at the right risks from the very start. Um, and finally, the human element, which is to go above transparency and owning the whole. Uh, Mary Parker Follett uh, talked often about assessing the total situation, a pioneer in management thinking, uh, before you uh, intervene in the situation. So Mark, these lessons are, are really well received. Thank you very much for that. We'll come back to Q&A shortly, uh, but before uh, we go there, let's uh, let's go to Anthea. Uh, Anthea's had a 23-year career at Bechtel uh, in various positions. She's uh, one of the female uh, master builders at Bechtel, and now at HS2. So we look and previously worked on Bond Street in Crossrail. So, um, so Mark and Anthea have uh, have overlapped uh, in the past as well in, in their uh, respective professional careers. So over to you, Anthea, in terms of your lessons for successful delivery of rail mega projects. Thank you very much. And um, it's great to have this opportunity to share. Um, one of the things I'm going to bring to this is I actually worked um, in the Ministry of Defence for a, a, a number of years. Um, before I joined Bechtel. So one of the things I'm gonna reflect is that big pro program uh, thinking um, and to bringing some of the lessons from major defense projects as well as the, um, some of the learning um, uh, from my uh, infrastructure career as well. So if you can throw up the slides, um, I, um, if you can if, move on to the next one. So that's, that's me. Um, I've just, I've got one slide, we're going to kind of, I've, I've got three things, um, 
Um, Mark had five, I've got three. And um, I hope it'll be interesting to see um, how our perspectives um, coincide because that was fascinating, Mark, and thank you. Um, and if you don't mind, I might pick up on a couple of the things as, as we go through. So there are three overarching principles for me or for mega programs. One is the people element. Um, the second one is thinking systems. Um, and the third one is the concept of having one team. So if you can just pop up the, the next slide. So when I think about people as an ingredient in um, a rail project, um, I'm thinking diversity, I'm thinking leadership, and I'm thinking capacity. So, um, you know, why diversity? It's a popular topic. Um, you know, diversity, we've got the gender element, obviously. Um, we've, I think diversity also in terms of disciplines. So Mark talked about needing teams, the right team at the right time. And, and absolutely that I would, I would, um, I, I would, uh, that ring truth, that rings true for me. But also it's about bringing, making sure those disciplines are involved early enough so that those risks that um, Mark talked about are seen early enough. So, and I also think that, you know, thinking about learning from cross sectors. So if you take um, uh, in HS2 at the moment, you know, projects often start as heavy civils projects. Well, there's another huge heavy civil project down the road in the southwest at Sellafield, you know, and so I think there's a lot of learning that can be transitioned, transferred from one heavy civils project to a rail project when it's in the heavy civils phase, for example. So don't just think rail when you think about um, your, either your people and your skill sets or your ideas. Um, so then the other thing about people is the experience and the diversity around um, ages and experience. So think about getting your apprentices in, think about your graduates all the way through to your super experienced people, um, because the mix is there to bring ideas, fresh thinking, as well as the experience um, as, as well. So diversity is the uh, first people ingredient. Um, now, the, the other business reason for having diversity is in the UK, certainly, there is um, a drop off in the talent available, in the numbers and the capacity of people available um, in the next 20 years. So, um, you always need to think about your capacity over time as well as your skills. So the imper business imperative for diversity is also in the UK, we need to broaden and get more people involved in rail in order to satisfy big uh, rail projects, but also the skills are transferable so they can be moved on to other parts of infrastructure build as well. So in terms of people, it's um, diversity first. The second element is leadership. You know, the leadership piece is how do you bring it all together? You know, how do you help people give of the best? Um, how do you enable people? Um, and for me, leadership isn't just about the top down piece. That is that is absolutely required. You know, Mark and his team at Crossrail. Um, but leadership can occur at every single element in the organisation. Um, and when I think of the organisation, we'll come on to how big I think of as the system in a moment, but it's um, people doing the work, it's the gangs, um, uh, it's the uh, talent at the coalface doing the work, the teams of twos and three of people who go around and do, do the things that we need um, as well. Um, so it's leadership everywhere. Um, and, you know, there's a range of leadership styles in all of that as well. Um, so. Uh, so that's leadership. And then part of the leadership piece is great communication so that internally um, it helps collaboration. You know, the teams collaborate um, and it makes people feel valued. All of that will help people do the best thing that they can. And then, um, uh, you know, in terms of capacity, I've, I've mentioned that already. So people, diversity, leadership and capacity. So then the next, the next bit uh, of the sort of pillar for me, um, and if you can slide on one, that would be great. This for me is all about systems. So 
my um, story around learning around systems is that I started out as a mechanical engineer. Um, and then I did say systems engineering um, at masters. And I can only say it just opened my eyes. Um, I did it you know, fairly early on in my career and it made me understand mechanical engineering in the context of something much bigger. It, you know, in the context of working alongside other disciplines in engineering and then also in bigger teams. So it opened my eyes to, um, you know, thinking of everything in terms of systems, whole systems thinking. Um, and so the second point for me in a rail systems project is thinking system. Think whole system. Think about all of the things that need to be considered. Look, you know, look for the gaps, find the gaps, plug them. Um, sort of leveraging off of what Mark, Mark said. Um, think about the whole life. So Mark was mentioning, you know, the risk profile changing over time. If you think through all of the things that are going to happen over the life, you can understand all of the ingredients that you need to make a success of it and the challenges and the risks and so on. So whole system, whole life and whole cost. You know, understand how, um, understand all the components of this system in terms of the cost, understand how they change over life. Now, if you're, and if any of you folks um, don't come from a sort of systems background um, or don't naturally think in systems terms, one of the things you can do after this session, grab yourself as a piece of paper, blank piece of paper, brainstorm, throw down all of the things that you think need to be thought about when you plan a rail project, okay? And you will, you'll be astounded by how many elements you do actually think of. And all of those are really part of the system because they all have to somehow integrate, somehow work together, whether they're the people, the processes, all the way down to you know, the materials, the tools and techniques that you, that you use to actually generate the outcome. So, um, you know, put simply in rail, um, you know, rail projects are more than heavy civils projects. And I think that was one of the, the particular um, lessons that um, uh, Mark was kind of alluding to. And you've got to think all the way through to the end of the project, the outcome, you know, the passengers, the communities you're going to affect to get to the end point. Um, and, you know, technically, you need to be thinking about the testing and commissioning. And if you start with that in mind and work backwards, then you'll be pulling in the right teams at the right time uh, and understanding how, uh, how to get to that point where you've fully tested and commissioned. Um, uh, tested and commissioned the whole thing. So um, think system, that's the system, the life. And then in terms of the cost, you know, establish, you've got to establish a good baseline and understand how, as the project evolves, the baseline changes. Um, clear scope, it sounds obvious, clear scope. Then you build your schedule around that. Um, and then understand that your understanding of cost will change over time, particularly um, in the early stages as the design progresses. And there's an appropriate way to cost that and put risk and contingency so that, um, you know, ideally you want a situation where there are no surprises. Um, and it's, it's kind of easy to say, uh, you know, much harder to do because you might be feeling like your crystal ball glazing. But this is where lessons come in. This is where applying learning from other projects comes in. So, um, you know, we're all, we're all looking at Crossrail um, and thinking and listening and learning about all of the things that um, uh, in hindsight we've learned. So, you know, using your costs, benchmarks, learn the lessons, you know, think about efficiencies, think about value management, all of, all of that good stuff. Put in place decent change management so that you can keep track of all aspects of the baseline as you move forward. And have a think, are you designing for a budget or are you exploring the cost as the design evolves? So uh, that's another thing to think about and that's about design philosophy. And then 
Uh, the last component of the three components of people think system is one team. Um, kind of for me, the main point about this is make cooperation or you could you know, elevate that to collaboration. You could elevate that beyond collaboration to what Mark mentioned as, you know, all being in the same whole or all being in the whole together. You know, make that the rational choice because people's behavior is a series of micro choices on, a, on, on an hour by hour, day by day basis throughout the supply chain. So when I think of Think system. I'm thinking from the customer all the way down uh, to the person who's actually, you know, doing the work, and then all of the people that support that. For me, that is the one team. You know, so what what we want to do is set up a system through, you know, the, you know, the procurement process, the contracting, um, how you set the whole system up to make it straightforward for people to do effectively. I've called it, you know, the you know, make cooperation a rational thing. It's help people make best for project decisions on a, an hour by hour basis throughout the life of the project. And that's, you know, thinking about your contract integration, reducing um, interfaces is a great way of trying to simplify what's a very complex, what, what's a very complex piece. And think about how your contracts work together uh, so that um, you know the supply chain can do the best thing that they can um, uh, for the for the project. So um, you know it's one team make cooperation the rational the rational thing to do. And you know part of that what helps a one team great management information shared shared picture. Um, uh, Mark um, mentioned it. You know it's a you know been a big big sort of thrust in the last few years and my experience more recently on, on Crossrail uh, was, was improving understanding everywhere and making a, of progress and the challenges people are facing because that helps problem solving. So um, my three ingredients um, are people, thinking system and one team make it make cooperation collaboration one all in the same whole the um the rational straightforward thing to do and that's it for me thank you thank you very much anthea so many overlaps between uh mark's lessons and anthea's lessons so people so human element again uh, that uh, both talked about uh, and Anthea in particular you raised the issue of uh, diversity leadership and capacity and diversity in many forms so you're you're a mechanical engineer Mark's an electrical engineer uh, and with you both of you have brought uh, that to bear uh, in, in the rail industry uh, as well as other industries you've touched on but equally uh, uh, people's backgrounds with the uh, with kind of professional and personal experiences that they've had um, and really helps to bring projects together um, and again, another parallel between both speakers and is the thinking system. So you, you also brought up this notion of almost whole life cycle uh, uh, appraisal, um, including cost, time, uh, but changing perceptions, how stakeholders will relate to that mega project over uh, incredibly long lifespans, uh, several generations. Um, and finally, the one team, which is to bring together partners, uh, contractors, um, system suppliers, software builders um, as one team. So the, again, the whole, owning the whole aspect uh, that Mark touched on as well. So this is a great segue for us to go into Q&A. We have lots of very interesting questions coming through. Um, if in, uh, a participant is interested in asking a question um, directly rather than uh, me moderating their text, um, there is an opportunity to unmute yourself, but you have to let me know and I'll ask Abe to bring you in. You can also turn on your video um, if you feel particularly brave, which we encourage you to, because the point is to, to have a discussion. But we've got a number of questions which I'll, uh, I'll, I'll curate for our speakers uh, and I'll ask Mark and Anthea to kindly respond to each question. So the first one comes from Leanne and, and she asks a very straightforward question, but perhaps a tricky one. How do you transition to transparency in complex mega projects? Should I have a go at that one? Um, I, I guess for me, 
taking over something that was in the ditch. It was easy because you just need a little bit of bravery to, uh, it couldn't get any worse. So you're better showing everybody and sharing the problem. Um, so I think once you're in the ditch, the only way out is transparency, to be absolutely honest. Um, I think, I, what would I say? I think it, it's easy. It does take some bravery to be transparent, but the technocrats, the engineer, like, like myself and, and Anthea, would have said previously it was impossible to describe Crossrail to anybody. So Crossrail took the opposite approach and it, it, it wanted a mantra of on time, on budget. And when your, your reputation is what you say times what you do. And unfortunately, the minute Crossrail's on time, on budget mantra was obviously not what they were doing, their reputation collapsed. So for me, um, although it's a little bit, takes a bit of bravery, you're better setting off on the transparency route immediately. And I think the, the general public and politicians are quite interested to know about it. And it, it is possible to communicate highly complex things in plain English to people. It's a skill, I think. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if Anthea agrees, but more transparency, the better for me. At the end of the day, we spent 20 billion pounds of public money. And it's been paid for half by London and half by UK government. And don't the people deserve to know? Shouldn't we be held to account? I would, I would say the opposite, isn't it? Why wouldn't you be transparent? I don't know, do you agree, Anthea? Yeah, you agree? I do completely on, um, you know, helping people understand the journey. Um, I think sometimes there's nervousness within the, the teams actually delivering to be transparent. And I think a prerequisite to getting to that point where you can be you know, transparent externally is helping the teams share. And, um, you, know, you know, Crossrail has tried and developed um, and implemented successfully an, a range of tools and techniques to allow the teams internally to bubble issues up with a view to getting them resolved quickly. So um, the, the key is, is making the teams and the supply chain, and, and, and that's across contractual boundaries, being really comfortable sharing information that, you know, that, that it is in everybody's best interest. Because when people run into trouble, um, that's when the going gets tough, that's when people get nervous. Um, and so um, that's the point at which you really need the bravery for, um, you, you know, the, the supply chain to step forward and say, oh, I've got a problem. And, and so there's a transparency, you know, so management information, top to bottom, automating some of that helps, you know, in a very practical point, if you automate some of that and that gets pulled up, that helps transparency because um, it, it reduces people's ability to filter I think that was a challenge, uh, you know, on other mega projects is that filtering that goes on. So automation helps of MI and then um, using it, sharing it, talking about it. Um, that, that's that's for me the, the, the piece that then allows that transparency externally. If I could just say one, one thing in, just to support Anthea, who would recognise what I'm about to say. I've said end dates are deadly. They become deadly when you get false greens. That's when you get a deadly end date. When the thing you're looking at isn't really green. It's not green. Why do people create an illusion for senior management to feel good? Well, that's why end dates are deadly. So the creation of windows yeah. and the, the realization that risk could occur allows people to call things red or amber. The minute you have a false green in a complex world like Crossrail, where it's, it's bigger than the ocean, and what happened in Crossrail in 2018, I had dashboards in 2018, it, they were green. They were green. We said we were 95% complete. We, um, we weren't, <laughs> we were 60% complete. And um, anyway, transparency starts with uh, no false greens. And a culture that doesn't criticize people, you almost want to actively flush it out, Anthea, you want to yeah. almost get people to tell you the yeah. gap help, so you can address it. Help yeah. people bubble the problems up, but it's. Dead, it's very difficult to do, particularly when, you know, um, across contractual boundaries, um, payments rest on it sometimes as well. So I think it's a, it's a real challenge. It's a real challenge. Yeah. So 
So on the transparency topic, because there are a number of other questions that have come up as well, and, and both of you shared uh, some technical aspects of it. So data automation, uh, sort of almost intercepting uh, a tendency um, a manager, a human beings tend to have in any organization to filter the data and the to, to use your words uh, or massage. Uh, in Oxford, we call it strategic misrepresentation, which is Latin for lying, uh, but we have to be uh, very academic about it. Um, so the question, are, and, 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 and Mark, you touched on some of the human elements, the cultural elements of how one creates the psychological safety to be able to be transparent. But why is the default to try and create that smoke screen? Well, I mean, I, I just, I tell you, I, I really enjoyed listening to you, Anthea. And um, I, if Crossrail had had a more diverse and inclusive leadership, mm. it would have had a better chance of people having that culture. There is no doubt that not just diversity of types of people, but the inclusivity of the environment are mm. absolutely fundamental. And lots of projects, I'm sure you all recognize this, have highly collaborative environments, but they're not inclusive. Mm. And I, I actually think, I don't know if Anthony would agree, the, it's actually starts at a very elemental level. And it's time we start, I've got a great friend who talks about putting the lens on top of EQ, EQ in project teams. And she says, the problem is Mark in major projects, people value IQ and in extremis, a bit of machismo and it can be a very male dominated environment. I think it starts with a more balanced approach to life. Do you agree, Anthea? It's um, I, I, it better I, if you're just kinder and nicer place, we might have a better chance. Yeah, I, I would agree. And the, um, the, the EQ piece helps liberate people to perform um, and I think it also helps when you have to navigate challenging program issues as well because there is bad news there are problems and um, it helps it helps um, with dealing with those in a constructive way as well. A hugely important point around the avoiding group things so that diversity becomes essential along with inclusivity um, and uh, I absolutely agree um, with the points that Mark and Anthony are making. Fantastic. I've just been made aware by our AV that if anybody would like to come in, you can raise your hand and that way they'll know uh, to unmute you as well um, in case we want to uh, uh, intervene um, um, in, into, the, into the webinar. We have another question from uh, Johan, uh, and they are asking, how do you resolve the contractual boundaries of individual procure work packages to, everyone, to get everyone to own the whole? So, you know, it's, it's commercially very sensitive. How do you get people to own the whole? Um, I'll, I'll say my view. I'm interested in Anthony's view, but... Uh... Crossrail was broken into 37 contracts because it was procured straight after the global financial crisis. So the whole industry in the UK was going to go to the wall. Everybody needed a bit of Crossrail. So they got broken into quite small packages to give everybody a fair go in the UK industry. That was a reality of the market at that time. My key lesson is the client will always have to take the risk back, always. And in particularly in a world that is so megally interconnected, the idea of a mega interconnected program, the risk sitting in the supply chain, it was really flawed. So we decided we'd take it all back in and we, we kind of reduced the risk profile of the supply chain. We took it down, including our program partners like uh, Bechtel or, or Jacobs. We, we took the risk bar down for everybody and we took the risk in ourselves. And the minute we did that, we, we started to see the green shoots of collaboration and owning the whole come together. I think it's, a, and I think to be fair, HS2 have really learned from this. And I think Anthea, it's right in HS2, you're putting system integration in the incentivization of the supply chain. I think Mark told me that. So I, yeah. I, think, the, I think it's a false God to think that you can absolve yourself and, and put the risk in the supply chain all sorted out themselves. And I think Crossrail's proven that, by the way. You can't walk away from the risk as the client, and eventually you might have to take it all. And that's what we did in 2019. We took all the risk back in, and we've paid for every cent of Crossrail since then, really. And I think we've had a better outcome. Um, what do you reckon, Anthea? Is that a... Yeah, I would say... Um, so um, I, I would say um, certainly 
I've seen it from sort of afar in rail projects, but certainly in the defence in defence projects, any you know, we, we used to say, you know, the, the supply chain definitely can't hold the risk. And I, I, I you know, what I've seen and holds true in, in rail as well, um, and what you've just articulated there. Um, I think the, you mentioned incentives um, there, Mark. Um, I think getting the right incentivization across whatever, you end up with contractual boundaries, they have to exist. So getting the right incentives across that work across multiple boundaries, including in with a customer organization is, is a key thing. And it, 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 it's, a, it's one of the things that helps people behave, parties behave in a rational way, um, and, and which, which then of course, it makes the job of delivering so much easier if everyone's quite simply pulling in the same direction. And then, uh, Anthony, just to build on that point, if the, if a misalignment takes place, what have been some good practices that you've observed, observed in your professional career to bring the owner and the contractor back in, in alignment? Well, um, my experience is you have to get people in a room and get them to talk. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe going back to that point about EQ, understanding the behavior and the, 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 what's driving the behavior and the concerns of the other party, um, the, the other, the other you know, contractual party is the key to it. And then, you know, you know, so it's, 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 it's enabling proper dialogue and right. then understanding the issues from both sides and then saying, well, what can we do to, you know, and then, and then the next bit is to say, well, what's what's the objective we're trying to achieve here? And coming to some joint agreement on what that objective is. Mm -hmm. That that I have seen um, uh, work and I've been involved with trying to help when there have been sticky problems. Actually, I'm thinking about, you know, crossrail issues I've been, I, I've helped um, address. It, it all boil down to bringing people into the room and talking. Fantastic. So good old technology. We've been talking ever since uh, human beings were formed. So um, I, I have seen instances of increasingly inflammatory correspondence traded between owners and contractors uh, and building up these massive claims, uh, which could have been resolved with a very quick chat in a, in a very amicable way. So I suppose, uh, um, you know, some of the traditional means of just getting together uh, and having a think through uh, apply as well. Um, but that's that's really, really phenomenal. Um, could you elaborate a little bit? This is Dr. Paul Chapman from Oxford, who's uh, who's wondering what does good leadership look like in mega projects, and particularly at every level, so not just at the very high level of project director or the CEO of a temporary organisation. Um, you know, what gives you confidence that uh, people at every level of an organisation are ready to lead uh, and and look after their bit of that complex whole? So I'll I'll, um, I'll have a go, Mark, and then and then you can pile in. So, um, what does good look like? Um, quite often, good looks like being able to take your peers with you, because um, it, even Mark, I guess, as the CEO, he can't act unilaterally, um, and. It, you take that and you replicate that through the through the the whole system, all of the people that are involved in delivering. And so, you know, leadership for me, a lot of it is 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 not necessarily people in formal leadership positions. It's the softer leadership where you can take your peers with you. That could be, you know, <laughs> think about the, the three three person. Um, uh, groups we had um, on Bond Street Station going around doing um, uh, MEP um, fit outs. Um, not only had they got, they had to work as a team, but depending on what the ta task was, one or another person might be in, in the lead. And then each of those groups, each of those groups need to then work and plan together. Um, so there's leadership across and, and, and bringing your peers with you. Um, and that um, I, you know, for big projects to succeed, that needs to be replicated at every level and across any boundary that you can find. 
Um, so leadership for me is about taking your peers with you and it's less the telling and it's also enabling people to bubble their problems up and creating a forum where people can uh, bring forward and then things can be solved. So that's in a nutshell um, for me what the looks like. Yeah, I would um, agree with that. I, I'll give you a frame though. The frame I have is that um, the result of leadership is to change the predictable outcome. The, mm -hmm. the, the point of leadership is to, to create something that won't exist without it. And my learning on Crossrail is unfortunately, entropically, it'll tend to chaos. It won't come together naturally by itself. Entropically, it'll tend to go to chaos. Um, it'll get done eventually, but it might take 20 years. So the act of leadership is to change the predictable outcome. How you do that, I, I completely resonate with, with Anthea about the stylistic thing about how you do it. The bit I would add to that is um, this pursuit of the gap and looking for what's missing. You know, it's, it's, it's really important in a mega program of high complexity, you're really in the pursuit of what's missing because generally what's missing will be how the active leadership can change the predictable outcome, not what is in front of you. And I see the leadership style, I completely agree that I won't repeat anything that Anthony said because her and I obviously think alike in the type of leaders, but it's mostly about collision avoidance and aerodynamics. It's mostly about, can you avoid the iceberg that you can't quite see yet? And obviously in Crossrail, the iceberg was so big. Unbelievably, it sank the ship. How did the team that was so expert not know they were three years out, not, not six months? How on earth did it happen? And it happened because they didn't spot the gap. They, the, the, the aggregation of risk was missed. It was missing. Mm. So I think um, active leadership is changing the predictable outcome change the predictable outcome with the style Anthea described. But for me, it's about a leadership team that's actively looking for a gap rather than dwelling on the success of what they've done. Um, I mean, we, we, started, we started signaling with something called PD2. It's a version of the software, PD2. We started and we declared victory. We started it far too early. We're now at PD20. PD20, we've come 18 versions of software. And when we started testing with PD2 in 2017, we thought version five would be good enough. It was nowhere near good enough, not, not a country mile. So I think, you know, that was, if we'd known there was a gap, we would have done something about it. But yeah, it's interesting. These are phenomenal ideas. So Anthea, your point around taking your peers with you is a phenomenal definition of leadership. And you give an example of two person groups. Um, and Mark, I love your idea of this disconfirmation thing. So psychologists often talk about confirmation bias. So uh, many people tend to want to fit a narrative to whatever they want to believe in. And they look for evidence to support what they already uh, hold to be true. But whereas you're saying is one has to have a disconfirmation uh, drive to look for the gap, look for the anomaly. Now, the question I have is, uh, and then bring your peers along with you, along that minding the gap uh, aspect of it. Um, in my personal experience, that often leads to friction, particularly when people see that evidence does not fit a, uh, a desirable truth that people want to believe, but is not, the, not quite the truth. How do you keep the temperature within tolerance in a project environment? So there's tolerable harmony among various people uh, to keep the project moving forward without it all just getting very, very unpleasant day to day. You know, Anthea mentioned something that we did when I, together with Anthea and colleagues, so when, when I took this over, we created a visualization system of all of the data and we tried to get to the data. So number one for me is neutrality in the data. Mm -hmm. no, no fiddling with the data. Mm -hmm. Crossrail was alleging to be 94% complete. It wasn't, it wasn't, the data, it wasn't complete. It wasn't complete in our document control system. It wasn't done, done. So the first thing you've got to do is just neutralize the data and produce it in a vanilla agnostic way that nobody could argue with. Um, so I, I, had, I had a boss once who said to me, <laughs> he was an interesting guy, but and he used to, I think, work for some very strange people. But he said, if you're ever invading an island, Mark, not that I've ever invaded an island, <laughs> but if you were invading an island, capture the radio station first. <laughs> He was an unusual character, but you get the idea. So the radio station is important. And in the radio station, you want it to be neutral data. And then if you can add 
on a, a, a humble management culture that is kind, doesn't shout at people, isn't aggressive, of course there'll be tension. Of course, but that's all right, isn't it? The, the grit creates the pearl and all of that. But I don't know if you agree, Anthea, but the one of the big problems in Crossroad was they'd lost sight of the actual data and the route home. Did you agree with that? You were kind of no, yeah. So I was, I was there when we, when we, um, when we kind of in, implemented that approach. Um, and I think that line of sight um, is is so important, and 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 data. I mean, I sort of touched on it with a sort of great I, great MI as being the sort of thread. But I, I, I totally agree. I, I think um, keeping the temperature down, tough though, super tough when there's pressure. Um, and that's, I guess, another aspect of leadership. And, you know, most of us would probably say we, we all have to work on that one because we all passionately want to get things done. And um, yeah. I think that's particularly, you know, that's a bit, you know, a particular facet of, of senior leadership um, is trying to create environments where you can have, uh, where people feel they can have the discussion and sort of escalate um, bad news and, and, and problems and keeping the temperature down you know the eq bit the how do you do that that's that's tough particularly when um you know this industry is dominated by drivers because that's what tend, typically gets things done so when you think about diversity of leadership teams i think that's another real value in having a diverse approach i'm, I'm not just talking about gender diversity diversity of thought in there wherever that comes from because that perspective can help temper yeah. how how news is received um so i think i think that's another ingredient of helping um with 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 the sort of um climate of discussion i do wonder i'm quite taken by these concepts of the incomplete leader you know quite mm. modern concepts of leadership and the best leaders on crossrail have been those who've absented their ego from the challenge people who've brought themselves to the challenge which is a hell of a one intellectually but people who've managed to abstract their ego and led by commitment and not led by personality. And um, we have a head of testing at the minute, Catherine Latham, and a head of LU system integration, Kim Kapoor. They both, I'm sure Anthony An 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 would agree, they both come and absent their ego, but uh, are ferocious in a good way, intellectually ferocious, but they've absented their ego. And I do think if anybody, younger person watching this is, um, can you develop a leadership style that's hard driving, but you, you aren't part of it? You aren't part of the drive. And I think that is absolutely fundamental. The days of the hard driving, egocentric, machismo are, are kind of gone. You want to be equally hard driving, ferocious intellectually, but you want to absent yourself from it and drive to something bigger than you. And I, I, if I was a younger, you know, I'm at the end of my career, but if I was at the beginning of my career, that's the style I would try to adopt. Can I remove myself from this challenge, but yet bring all of myself to it? Quite a difficult skill, but um, I think that they're the leaders that will survive in the future. It's just too complex. You know, the egocentric leader can't know everything. Yeah. It's impossible now. So. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a great, a, a, great, um, a, a great viewpoint, Mark. Yeah. Absolutely. This, this is turning into a masterclass in mega project leadership. So we're, <laughs> we're, this is being recorded for posterity as well. Uh, but I think the, this balance is yin and yang of, uh, you know, uh, capturing the radio station and having neutralized data, heart systems uh, on one side, but then having the emotional intelligence to bring people into the room, give them the psychological safety, um, you know, without one's own ego. So you could be hard driving, yet be, uh, you know, ego neutral. Uh, these are phenomenal ideas. Um, and so Certainly, uh, a way to uh, make a project is simply too complex to be harnessed um, any other way. Um, we have a huge number of questions, and I'll ask uh, Jack to come in shortly uh, with the help of our AV to talk about customer centricity. But before we, uh, as we make that happen in the background, uh, let me just ask one question from uh, Henry in Hong Kong, um, and he's asking. Um, Governments, particularly as we go outside the boundaries of the projects, a project being a temporary organization with a very uh, specific boundary, it has 
institutional masters in terms of the operating environment. Um, and, and no project can live without that sponsoring uh, authorizing environment. Um, how would you go to a minister and tell them, sorry, minister, I'm not gonna give you a specific date of opening or I'm not gonna give you a budget. Uh, I'm gonna give you an envelope. Well, it's, it's, it's a skill, you know, it's a skill. And I'm not saying I'm any good at this, by the way. And it is easier when you're in the ditch to give bad news than when you're not in the ditch. But um, I, I guess I had some time in Australia, actually, that I enjoyed and worked, worked with politicians there. And I think what the politician values most from a technocrat is frank and fearless advice. Of course, they expect you to be driving to the very front edge. But always tell the truth to politicians as a technocrat. Always do your best and show them what the risk profile is, but equally drive hard to the beginning of it. The very worst case scenario for a politician is for a technocrat to give them false hope, because guess what? The politician, why would they know? Why would they know that um, it takes 20 versions of software, not five, to do the software? So this kind of desire to please politicians is natural in a technocrat. But in my, in my career, and I've been up and down, I've, had, I've made mistakes in this area, I've got some things right. The thing in my experience that political people value, the authorizing environment is that transparency, frank and fearless advice from the technocrat, um, neutral, non-egocentric, not here for my benefit, professional, hard driving to the front edge, but realistic, you know, realistic would be the, the word I would think. Uh, they, they don't want pessimistic people either, you know, they don't want... They don't want Cassandra is about to decide that it's all going to end. So I guess it's a balance. Eh? And, and I don't know if I get it right at all, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But the people I admire do, you know, I could tell you people I really admire who can communicate effectively confidence that you're going to go as fast as you possibly can. But also, if bad things happen, I'm going to catch the ball, but there would be a consequence. And, that, that, I don't know if that answered your question, Ati, but it's a... I've got a follow-up, but uh, I think let, let, we'll hear from Anthea and then I'll, I'll, I'll come back with a, with a follow-up. I um, totally agree with what Mark said. I think there's something as well, depending on your setup, um, is if, if the if top-tier company, for want of a better word, can work really closely with the sponsoring um, body and that close relationship... Um, I think enables um, uh, enables that um, frank advice um, that Mark was talking about. So the way to, the way to get to that is having that having that close relationship between the sponsoring body um, and the sort of top tier company. And it, obviously, that arrangement is differs depending on um, what. Um, you know where you are but, mm -hmm. but for me that's that's the thing that then enables um the 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 advice and it is an art and it is mm -hmm. a skill and there's probably some people you would deploy to do it and other others that you wouldn't mm -hmm. so i think two follow-up questions on that one is mark your message of truth through power is very well received and that uh, trying to create a feel-good uh um, communication is almost certainly going to backfire, um, you know, and and, and here you, you sort of mentioned this notion of building a relationship. So two issues. One is how does one build that relationship, particularly in, in, a, in a 10 to 12 year mega project, uh, the project director, the CEO may change. Uh, so the relationships are sort of time, time bound is, is one. And a second related question is, Mega projects are really technical. There's a lot of technical detail. Um, the authorizing environment, people who are actual decision makers may have literally not a clue. Um, how do you chew down that complex, that technical complexity and communicate that in ways that they can actually uh, comprehend uh, and still have confidence in? So, um... On the how do you build, I think the, the other thing about the time bound relationships, of course, is that on mega projects, you might also well, quite likely to have a change of government. So there's another thing to navigate there where the the funding body may change and may change um, as well. So um, you've got both the both the government and the sponsoring organisation and both the senior leaders changing 
mm-hmm. maybe not at the same time. So lots and lots of movement over the time. So um, there's there's how do you paint a consistent picture over time? So that storyboard is really important. And then um, being prepared to explain it again and again and again, and don't assume that the new person understands it. So there's something around um, continuity of communication. Mm -hmm. And then your your other question was around simplicity. Well, quite often when we try and explain complex things, we maybe boil them down to analogies. And so analogies in the in a in, in in language that the receiver is going to maybe understand, I think is, is always powerful. Um, uh, you know, you know, so so it's like it's just like this, really, you know. Um, so yeah, analogies can help. Um, I think. I mean, I, I think it's a skill. So you know, I'm an engineer like Anthea, but I, I read Anthea highly in this as well. We've learned a way of behaving with lots of different types of jobs and good experiences so if you're a younger engineer watching this you um it's a skill you've got to kind of learn you know because if you want to progress this is a how would you enroll people where you do it to giving them confidence that you can that you can deliver what you say you're going to do the other, the other tip i'd give everybody um i agree with everything anthea said but the best piece of advice i ever had in this area was can you have conversations mark within somebody else's world so can you have a conversation for enrollment, for commitment, for just communicating information? Can you have that conversation in the other person's world, i.e. in their perspective, mm-hmm. in their paradigm, what's important to them, how they feel, how they think, rather than bring in your perspective? It's another example of how can you absent yourself from it? I mean, the most powerful leadership thing anybody can do is to take themselves out of the situation, yet still deliver it. So my, my top tip dealing with any difficult, challenging politician, bureaucrat, um, CEO, anywhere is to, to have the conversation in their world, in their perspective, and actively have the conversation, listen actively in it. And, and I think you, you, you see great things happening when you stand in somebody else's shoes rather than your own. These are great tips. So build a storyboard, communicate that consistently um, and communicate it in their world. And I I think that point goes both upwards and downwards. So, um, you know, uh, leaders in higher positions, when they really listen uh, with empathy uh, to people reporting to them, creates that culture of allowing problems to bubble up. But equally, people at more technical level are taking the time to simplify and build that storyboard to communicate um, also aids that communication. Great, I'm going to turn to Jack to ask his question and then to Peter Ewan. Um, Jack, you are on. You can unmute yourself. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, firstly, I, at if, um, to Mark and Athena, I think uh, um, you're spot on with your, with your uh, lessons learned, but and, you know, a project like this has got three phases. It's got a planning phase, it's got a construction phase, it's got an operational phase. And uh, one must be very really wary that you don't do things in your construction phase that's going to burn you in the operational phase. So if I can talk about the planning phase, uh, the planning phase, you have to make a call on what type of contract, your contract design that you're going to use. Um, and then to talk about risk, you know, identifying risk, and then very importantly, to make a call on dispute resolution so that you can have a predetermined dispute resolution process that you can hopefully, won't you, you know, because half the lawyers in South Africa, um, I kept them busy for, for seven years. So <laughs> I don't want to know what I spent on, on, on lawyers. And in the end, we chased them all out and we, we got an engineering solution. But uh, that's another lesson. The other, the other thing is that on the operational side, you know, once you have in construction, you're chasing the spec, you're chasing um, the time, you're chasing um, the contract. But in the operations, you, you're chasing two things. You want to op- operate a train service on a daily basis with a certain level of punctuality and availability. And that's all you're going to do. And what worries me about, about uh, Crossrail, where you said you've taken over the risk in, in uh, 2019, which is fine, which means you, you've taken over a financial obligation. 
but risk is also future action that you're doing. And you could be taking over quite a lot of future risk and, and activities, which could be quite a big threat to your budget. And, and we've seen it on, on, on the train that we built in, in South Africa is that, you know, you, you, this thing gets carried through into your, into your operational side. So, so one has to be very careful about not moving that risk a latent risk into, into your operational phase. Yeah. So, so uh, I would have loved if you'd said, yeah, are two lessons learned from the planning phase and yeah, two or three lessons that you have to keep in mind when you go to the, to the operational phase. Yeah. But the rest is fine and I think it's, it's a great presentation. Yeah, I, I, um, I mean, I've been lucky in my career that I've, I'm an engineer and a project person, but I've managed to be in operations when I run the tube. And, you've got no idea what it's like to run an operation until you've actually done it. Yeah. And I'm sure Anthony would agree, one of the most unhelpful tropes of Crossrail was the operator's not ready. Why don't they just take it? The bar's too, too high, the pedantic. That was one of the most unpleasant and wrong things about Crossrail. And one of the things I did to your point is the COO, the person who's running the railway, we, he was here around the table, but we gave him super, super status. And in fact, he almost became right now, he's kind of peer to peer with me. And, and, and you know, I'll leave in the next three or four months and he'll take over. So to your point, the operator, it's more than being around the table. They've got to be central to the decision making. And I never want to hear again project people complaining about how, how the operators just need to take it it's one of the most unhelpful tropes in, in ma major programs. You've got to stand in the shoes of the operator authentically and realize what it's like to carry 200 million people a year. And it's not easy task. You know? I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd add just um, a, a perspective from um, the way uh, UK defense programs are run. Um, in those, you have the user, the uniformed person, this is, this is a, um, embedded in the teams right from the outset of the, of the procurement phase to try and bring that um, user focus in to, you know, into the process right from the requirement setting and the requirements are owned by, you know, by the, by the, um, uh, by the appropriate part of the armed forces. So, um, and it's something that, you know, I'm sure that we'll, we'll learn from the Crossrail experience. How do we Bring that same concept of understanding the operations and how do we how do we bring that forward and make sure that we we understand that risk by way of context jack uh, vandermeva first of all jack i'm honored you're here um, a very warm welcome uh, is the ceo of how train and built uh, uh, the public private partnership in Houting province in johannesburg uh, uh, connecting um connecting uh, the Houting province and now is the chairman of transport authority um uh, for for the province so uh, jack it's a real honor uh, that you're here with us uh, whilst since you're here could i ask you a question around public private partnerships and of course uk government's decided to go down the public procurement rule, both for Crossrail as, a, as well as for HS2, um, either in developed countries or in emerging markets. What's your advice on public-private partnerships? Um, a, whether they work, um, and, and second, how, how do you deliver PPPs in rail um, successfully? Actually, between a rock and a hard place. Um, to do a PPP in a developing country, you need the skills, you need the experience, which is very, I mean, I was amazed when, when uh, um, Mark said that there's not, there's not enough talent in the UK. Um, you can divide that by 10,000, that's the amount of talent we have in, in, in developing countries. So firstly, a, a PPP, um, it's, it's defined, and I think it, it, it works well, although rail become so complex you know i went to crossrail i went down to st pancreas station and if you want to work out beforehand 20 years ago to say this is the this is the risk and this is the type of challenges you'll you'll have if you get it right you're just lucky i mean you, you you're going to get it right because you're clever so so uh, I, I think rail um, is about at the limit especially a complex rail project at the limit of what a ppp can do because the risk is defined beforehand and you take the risk and it's yours forever. 
the UK approach of saying we'll share the risk, you have to have a really sophisticated and a mature market so that you can understand, you know, a type of rise and fall between the contractor and, 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 and the client. Um, and it has to be really open book. Um, otherwise, you will, um, the contractors will just develop a new skill of hiding claims in, into, into, um, into the, the system. So um, I, I think in 10 years time, when we have this, this again, we're gonna talk about a new method in the UK. This thing about sharing risk, um, I think it's, it's better than, than the, the, the pure PPP, but I don't think it's the answer. It's not the panacea because the risk has to be defined. And, and, and what worries me, I work with the politicians and you know this thing about continuity of communication, you have to sell it, you keep on telling it. You have to keep on telling your premier or your minister the, the, the cost has moved, you know, we now identify that it's gone up, it's gone up, it's gone up, and uh, it becomes quite unpleasant to, to do it. So uh, I don't think it's the answer. It, uh, I think in the case of Crossrail, um, you could have spent the next 10 years in court if you kept saying the contract has got the risk. You have to prove that the risk is not well defined in the beginning, and you know what will happen. The solicitors will, will take you to, to, to the cleaners. Um, but uh, at, at the moment, I think this is a this is a compromise of, of saying how do yeah, we share okay. the risk. You're right, Jack. They would have stopped. You know, if we tried to leave the risk with them, they would have put their tools down and stopped because they could they could you know we could lick you know the size of Crossrail. When I took over, we were spending 150 million pounds every four weeks. We yeah. we could have liquidated the supply chain. Um, mm. The bit I think about PPPs that I think needs to change. Often you see a hard DNC in the middle of the PPP, don't you? And I think there's some innovation. I was talking to somebody in Melbourne where it's a road project, I think, but they're putting a target cost risk sharing approach in the middle of the PPP. And I think there's some merit in that because a hard DNC in the middle of a PPP drives some very strange hard behaviors. And we've seen a lot of that, you know, but there's still a place for PPP, but the DNC is something interesting, I think. Yeah. The, the, the only thing, again, it, it's still then up to the engineers to say, in this project, this is going to be the big crisis. And let's, let's take that out of the risk. And if it was in the case of Crossrail, as you said, they thought the tunnel was going to be the crisis. And the tunnel turned out not to be the biggest crisis. So, so you have to, then again, pre, pre the pr project. Uh, in our case, we thought uh, we, we built um, 15 kilometers of tunnel under Johannesburg. We thought that would be the crisis. Uh, we had very big dolomite area that uh, we had to build eight kilometers of bridges over there. And the contractor was a French contractor, and he said, "Man, we eat dolomites for breakfast. We don't want you. We don't want you to share the dolomite." And they lost a lot of money there. Uh, and the tunnel, we we thought that they would be willing to give us a discount for the tunnel. They said, "Don't worry, we'll run a TBM." And, and, and do it. And they, the tunnel wasn't so bad, but the Dolomites was at an absolute cost. So it, it's again, you know, do you, do you take a job and analyze it and say, fine, these are the risk elements that we're going to take out and we'll have a special res regime for, for those elements and not, not have them linked to the PPP. So it's a decision you have to take. The um, thing I like about PPPs my, um, is uh, that that risk analysis up front and um, you know, how much better would other projects be if that level of scrutiny uh, around the risk at the front end was done, I often think. Mm -hmm. So there's the, the element. So, but Anthea, do you see more collaborative contracting happening from, from your vantage point? Is that an area that uh, the supply chain is interested, generally interested in supporting um, alliancing some, uh, type of contracts or even formal PPP type of contracts going forward? I think it, uh, it, um, it it depends where the risk ends up lying. For any for any any part of the supply chain, it, it's where where does the risk end up? Mm -hmm. um, and and different companies will have different appetites for for that for that risk because you know every company goes into a into a project wanting to um, you know do a great job for the customer and um, and make you know the, the the margin they need to um, to uh, operate and thrive. So. Um, I think as long as the risk 
the risks and how the whole system and all of the contracts kind of work is understood, then, then, then you know, understanding that helps people make uh, decisions. Great. We've got 10 minutes. We're going to uh, gradually draw stumps. Um, Jack, thank you very much. Please, please do stay online. Um, but I'll turn to Peter Ewan now, um, and uh, who's recently served as uh, a five-year uh, leadership position at MTI in Hong Kong. So, Peter, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and Mark and Anthea, um, fantastic insights and really good thinking. It's a good job the video's not been on because I've been impersonating a nodding dog for the last uh, hour or so. Um, I just wonder if I may just take us back a little bit to this, this notion where we get uh, uh, broadsided. You know, we go home on a Friday night thinking the project's OK. Monday morning, oh, my God, we're three years late. And, and Crossrail isn't the, the only one. And I've just come from NTR and we had similar there. And I have uh, done plenty of time in the MOD and we have lots and lots of history of it happening in the MOD. And I really buy this idea of EQ, have done for, for some time, um, and, and you know, that ties in with leadership and, and all these good things which you know, we should strive to do. But it seems to me that beyond all that, there is some, some hard truths. And, and you know, 72,000 people working on Crossrail, I think you said, you know, how can you get that, that, that whole message? How can you change the behaviours and culture of all of those people? So in addition to all that, would, would you agree that you have to have a, a what I'd call a second line of defence, an independent assurance team who is sitting there and can ask the difficult questions and has the ability to stand back from the fire that everyone's fighting at first on a day to day uh, on a day to day basis? And that brings into this whole idea of Mark, you were saying about the data and we've talked about transparency. It's very, very difficult for a, a governance regime to be able to dive into that uh, or even for the MI to be uh, produced in a way that they can sit once a month in a project board and say, yep, yeah, okay, I've got all this understanding. The assurance for me needs to be on a near continuous basis. And so therefore you need to be able to dive into the data, you need to ask the difficult questions, you need to be able to perhaps run a bit of predictive analysis on things that might happen, uh, a few what if scenarios to try and tease out and to rather than just let bubble up, to actually sort of put some air underneath the thing to make sure these things bubble up to the right level. And so therefore you can get the controls in place. Yeah, I mean, um... <laughs> Not trying to get my future career, but you know, caveat, I, I, could, I could spend a career doing this probably. But one of the things that happened in Crossrail, because of the fixation on the end dead, it, it, this is quite unbelievable to understand, but it, you know, it's part of the public record. The in 2017, conventional project controls were turned off. You know, it was um, and value was turned off. The P6 program lost legitimacy. Lod two. Um, faded away, the project representative was um, not really respected in the program, all because they were driving so hard, they just did not want to know that um, the, the, the problems, I suppose. We've done the opposite, we've rebuilt our lot two, we rebuilt lot three, the project representative has access all areas, we reinstituted um, the, the expert panel, I was very lucky to work for Tony Meggs as the chair of Crossrail in, my, in the first couple of years I was doing this. And Tony had a whole ethos around disparate voices. And now a lot of people didn't like that, even in the leadership team. Well, Mark, there's too many voices, but it's, it's how do you get the nuggets, Peter? How do you stop the advisory? How do you stop them just critiquing from the sidelines, like Stadler and Waldorf from the Muppets, you know, criticizing? How do you get the advisory net, the, the levels of assurance, how do you get them enabling? And how we've tried to do it is to, back to this concept of spotting the gaps, could we get these very, very senior expert people to spot gaps and produce a pessimistic view, really? Because you want your program director, we've got a brilliant program director, a guy called Jim Crawford, very famous guy, best in the business probably in, in the UK context, there's nobody better than Jim. And he's naturally optimistic. You don't want to knock that out of them, do you? You just want to provide the counterpoint so a conversation could happen about the difference. You definitely don't want to turn Jim Crawford into Mark Wilde. He'd be worried. His hair would be even greyer than it is now if he was like me. So I think it's about getting the balance of people who are glass half full, glass half empty. And we've tried to do it by really valuing the, the assurance net. I wish we'd had foresight at the beginning because it's clear now that the size of Crossrail human beings, one human being or two human beings can't keep it in the head. I'm sure you had that in MTR as well. These things are too big. 
And I'm sure Anthea will be the same in HS2, it will be the same in Hinkley. These programs are so big, you probably need some artificial intelligence to inform people. And what I like about Foresight is, I was talking to Tiff about this a moment ago, could you code the AI tools with that relevant balance of pessimism and optimism? Wouldn't that be an interesting thought to give leadership teams the insight they would need? Um, and I'm sure the leadership team we had in Crossrail, which was a brilliant team, excellent people, they just lacked the insight. So they created a management override of their experience. If they'd had the insight, we would have had a different outcome. We'd still be late, but we wouldn't have been as late, I don't think. Great point. Yeah, so um, I think that goes having a good assurance that can challenge. That's, it's a challenge. What you're talking about, really, Peter, is a challenge function. And, and Mark, what, what, what Mark was talking about. So an assurance is one way of creating that, that um, internal uh, tension. So, um, you know, I, I think it's important because it means you're an informed customer. You know, and, and an informed customer can get the best out of the supply chain as well. Other phrases used previously, you know, intelligent customer, um, you, you get the picture. It's um, if you're informed, if you can uh, create the right challenge function. I mean, other, other ways that they're more ad hoc, um, you know, assurance is a continuous thing, ideally. So progressive assurance, continuous. And then you can interject that and overlay things like peer reviews. And if you, if you set up peer reviews right and ask the right question, and I, do you know, I was just thinking of, you know, what would, a, you know, what would the peer review you know, on, on my bit of HS2 look like if I, if I asked them, go spot the gaps, <laughs> you know, what, what have we, what have we missed? And, you know, and I've, I've used peer reviews recently quite a bit um, and they are so insightful because inevitably they will see things from a different view point and they'll, they'll, they'll bring things in, but they, those are kind of one-offs. And I think having that strong assurance threads all the way through um, uh, is, is important. And it's important as well for cycling lessons so that you can institutionalize uh, and, and systematize things that happened maybe five years ago, because with the turnover of people, it's so easy to not get that, it, it's to reinvent the wheel. And I think good assurance can help avoid that as well. I mean, I, I think the perhaps the greatest lesson out of Crossroads might be what Anthea's has said, are you assuring to confirm what you already know and want to hear? Or are you assuring to inform you and create a different creative space? I think that's a fantastic point, Anthea. And the future leader will be using assurance to be creative, not to confirm what they already think. You know, they want to get a green rating, don't they? They want an amber rating. More yeah. likely, you want to know where the gap is. You'd yeah. rather have a red rating, wouldn't you? Really, if they could produce a gap. It's a great point, though. Yeah, for, for me, it um, it doesn't necessarily. Yes, I use the word we use the word challenge, but you know, it, it, if if we take this to a, a sort of you know where the uh, ideal space, the first line should welcome it because they don't have the time to do this extra work. They don't have the time to do the depth, and they should welcome the, those those challenges or those questions, and then sometimes be able to answer, uh, but then have that leadership ability to say, do you know what, you've got a point here, because actually this will make it better, and this will actually get a better delivery. Um, it, it's, 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 I think it's almost unfair on the first line, the people trying to do it a day-to-day -day delivery, to suddenly say, but stop, stop there. Can you just have a look at what the risk might be in two or three or four years time? Uh, it is, it's just not, not normal behavior because they are just worried about getting through the day and making sure that the, yeah, everyone is there for working tomorrow. It's got to be someone independent of the main delivery arm that does it in my, in my view, anyway. Great, well, we've had a phenomenal conversation. This Q&A began with transparency, it's looped right back up to transparency. In between, we've talked about very meaty issues from how to deal with political leadership to how to exhibit leadership oneself uh, in one's mega project. Uh, perhaps Roger Bayliss provides a very nice summary, which is to be hard on the issues, but soft on the people. Uh, this has been an absolutely thrilling uh, first seminar together. Um, just looking at the list of people who've joined, I think we've got a bit of an industry 
uh, uh, thinking group going. Uh, so we hope to reconvene uh, with more uh, uh, more such seminars in the near future, uh, particularly deep diving into the rail industry. Um, personally, I've got a huge amount of respect for everybody out there building uh, this essential infrastructure uh, for global welfare. And above all, rail uh, is the most sustainable form of infrastructure there could be given uh, given this carbon profile as well. So uh, Godspeed, uh, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you to our speakers, Mark and Anthea. We look forward to welcoming you again. Really appreciate it, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you.